Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to talk about the Templars. You remember them, the Knights Templars? A lot of people think that they don't exist anymore, but they actually do. A lot of people also think that it's only men in the order, and it's not. We're going to talk about some of the misnomers and misconceptions, and maybe even preconceived notions of their ties to nefarious groups and secret societies. There's reasons for having things kept secret, and then there's reasons for having things kept secret, right? So today, we're going to use some discernment, and we're going to learn the difference. We're going to listen to the current Grand Master of the Knights Templar. His name is Timothy Hope. I'm radio and television host Jimmy Church, and I'm here to uncover the truth about some of life's biggest mysteries. If this is revealed, everything has to be rewritten. My guest today is Timothy Hogan, Grand Master of the Knights Templar, and an expert on the esoteric history of humankind. He was probably broadcasting this energy all around the planet. Technical assistant Josh. Josh, can you pull up the map? Yeah. Also joins us to help set the scenes. Join us as we deep dive to get to the bottom of some of the most intriguing questions of our time. Have you seen the Ark of the Covenant? And for any of you that don't have Gaia TV, you should subscribe. Totally awesome, awesome, awesome platform. Welcome to Into the Vortex. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. And today, we're going to jump into one of the most controversial subjects for this community, which is the Knights Templar. And our guest today is Timothy Hogan, Grandmaster of the Knights Templar. And being able to go directly to the source for this information, it's not only important for the community, but it's very important to me. And I'm pretty excited about this. Josh, you ready to get this going? Oh, I'm excited. I'm fascinated with the Knights Templar, and I'm excited to continue my education. You're the right man for the job. Great. <laughs> well, welcome, Timothy. And we need to really just jump straight into this. And the most important question to, to start this off is, what are what what is the true origins of the Knights Templar? Well, you know, most, most historians will say the Knights Templar were founded in 1118. Actually, the order was started as early as 1096. And uh, it took a while before they got involved in Jerusalem. Uh, and, you know, they were doing stuff prior to the Roman Catholic patronage, which, you know, existed for a while um, until it was removed in 1307. Well, we have the historical side that we're all taught and the dogma that has been established uh, since then that they were there to escort the Crusades and to defend the Crusades and, and have a military presence uh, yeah. there in Jerusalem. But then we have the other story, which is they were digging, they were searching, they were looking for artifacts and text, and and some things may have been spirited out of Jerusalem. How can we address that from a historical perspective? Were they were they searching for things? They were definitely searching th for things, and uh, not only that, but they there was a belief, uh, a, a definite belief that there was a primordial tradition that that had existed uh, prior to a deluge, uh, you know, which we would refer to as Atlantis. And that when it collapsed, there were pockets that had spread out to different parts in the world. So they were trying to seek out these different pockets to uh, obtain 
what these pockets were preserving, uh, and then also to to dig in areas that they absolutely knew there were there were things to be found. But let me stop you right there, if I may. Yeah. You use the A word. Mm -hmm. You just said Atlantis, yep. and most haven't connected. Uh, the Templars with Atlantis, and when you say something like that, what are you actually trying to say? I mean, they started out looking at, uh, you know, the Torah and the Old Testament and the the stories of Noah. I mean, here's this story of there was this cataclysm that occurred where there was this massive flood, and uh, they had connections with groups in the Middle East, particularly uh, groups like the Druze and the Sabaeans and others, who are preserving and translating texts uh, that alluded to these earlier civilizations and, and uh, including Greek and Roman texts. So they, they had exposure to the works of Plato and, and others, which talked about this pre-civilization. So they wanted to find out, okay, where's the technology from this pre-civilization? Where's the philosophy from this pre-civilization, you know, what was their religious beliefs, what was, uh, what has been preserved from it so that they could bring it back into Europe and get Europe out of the Dark Ages. Did they understand what they were discovering and, and how did they translate that knowledge into something that not only that could be applied to their mission and what they were doing, but how do you understand a high technology culture, you know, from Atlantis? to their period. There were allusions to technology within the Bible itself, and that's what they were primarily looking at at the time. There weren't a whole lot of books around, you know, and so they, you know, there were allusions, particularly uh, within the Torah, the, talking about the Ark of the Covenant, which was this device that could do all these crazy things, and if people touched it, they would be electrocuted to death, basically. And they were working with people like Rashi of Troyes uh, in France, who uh, was a good friend of uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who wrote the rule for the Templars. Uh, and they were passing on a knowledge and a history of, hey, here, you know, there are these artifacts and they are buried in certain areas and this is where you can find them. Um, so go down and get them. What did they find? So uh, in their archeological digging, they found a number of things. Uh, they did find uh, a series of boxes or arcs, which had also been incorporated on the Egyptian temple walls. They discovered substances of, uh, you know, strange, mysterious mm -hmm. substances is, is how they described it, that, uh, which we would call mana. Mana from heaven? Like mana from heaven, yeah. Right. Uh, but it was a substance that they learned that they could m manufacture alchemically. Uh, they also just, so they, they discovered these lost arts and sciences. They also discovered tombs of a number of holy people that uh, they discovered their bones and uh, they collected them and, and brought them back. And, and some of this was a real problem because it was contrary to the narrative that the church was perpetuating at the time, but it was completely in line with their own beliefs. They tended to be more of a Gnostic persuasion, you know, which was uh, they believed that anybody through their own uh, efforts could attain a direct knowledge of the divine. They didn't need a priest to do it. So uh, let me let me jump in right there. Josh, um, uh, pull up the cartouche because people ask about evidence. You know, okay, yep. these are extraordinary claims, sure. but but how can you back this up? Yep. And I want you to look at this. This is from Egypt, and this, I call this a cartouche, but this appears to be a, a cartouche with an arc represented there. Is this what I'm looking at? Yeah, that's right. It's an arc box and it's levitating off the ground, it should be pointed out. And, the, and that cartouche thing that you're talking about is actually a field. It's like an electric field that's around it that's attached to a, uh, you know, it's like a rope that the, that the uh, pharaoh on the left is holding to, to control it. This is an example of one of these boxes and you can find them 
all over the place. This was this particular one was at Edfu, where there's the Edfu building texts that also talk about probably the most historic, collapse. important text on on planet Earth uh, right there in Edfu. For sure. Um, here, the reason why I bring up the cartouche symbology is the Egyptians when they represented something inside of this shape, the cartouche shape. It, it suggests nobility. Uh, it, it's uh, it's related to the pharaoh. It's extremely important. Yeah. And so to have something like an ark uh, represented here, it's uh, it, it's huge to them. Yeah. It is my understanding. It's my belief, and certainly the belief of others that that what they were talking. They they discovered these boxes were basically like capacitors. They could build up large amounts of electricity uh, that would discharge, and if you didn't handle them properly, they would, you know, they could shock you to death. Do you think this is the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant? Well, according to our Templar tradition, there were actually multiple Arks okay. that were discovered. Let, 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 Josh, yes. this next image that, that Josh has, I think is extraordinary because this, I think, represents exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Because here, yeah. it, it looks like we've got four. Yeah, and this is at Dendera. Uh... And I want you to just look closely at these, this shape here, because this is symbolism for you. And see how this looks like candles on top? Now, picture this with a stand. And it's that very sacred Jewish candelabra because there's something very sacred about shapes and symbols. Hidden meanings everywhere. Uh, yeah, there's four, four arcs there and you can see they're issuing forth the electricity uh, out of the, the tops of them. There were multiple arcs, I think, that were being used around Egypt. Uh, certainly one of them uh, ended up becoming the ark within the Hebrew tradition. Uh, some have even speculated that maybe the reason why the Pharaoh was even chasing Moses was because he had stolen one of these arcs out of Egypt. And, and that's what he was really trying to get. So um, it, it's a... You know, but we find them on the temple walls all over the place. And usually associated with this ark, you also find these depictions of these these conical white cakes or these mounds of what would be mana, described as mana in the Bible. I'm going to swing back. Also, <clears throat> before Jimmy swings back, let me just add a little insert here. Because. Fun fact, while we're unveiling all of these fabulous truths, the true definition of Bethlehem, you know, that place that Jesus was born, that the star of Bethlehem led the three magi to, if you break that down in Hebrew translation, Bet means house and Lahim means bread. It's the house of bread, right? And Jesus even said in either Matthew or Luke, I don't remember which one now, I'll check in a minute, that he is the bread of life, that he is the house of bread. So Jesus is also manna from heaven. And yeah, he literally said those words. I'm going to find it and bring it up in a minute. Let's continue listening. Jimmy wants to circle back. Coming back to that, yeah. Is it is it possible that these these arcs or one of them made it out of Egypt and Jerusalem and back into Europe by the Knights Templar? Yeah, according to our records, uh, we actually recovered six arcs that we brought back into Europe uh, via through Portugal, well, through Lebanon. Uh, there's a site called uh, the Tomb of Hiram, 
which you can find in Lebanon, and it's actually not a tomb at all. It was just a vault where these things were held. It was there for a while and before it would move to Portugal, and then from there up to uh, Scotland, and then from Scotland, they were brought over here to the New World. To the, to the United States. So yeah. there's a what possibility. What was to become the United States, yeah. Josh, if we found an Ark of the Covenant here in the United States, what would you say? My mind would be blown, and I wouldn't be able to stop talking about it for a long time. The fact that there's four arcs is the first time I've ever heard that, and the fact that it could be around the world is super compelling and fascinating to me. Well, this would truly rewrite history. Yeah, for sure. Let's, uh, I want your reaction to this too as well. Um, here, you brought up mana. Mm -hmm. So here is a mana jar. Yeah. And now when we... When we see something like this, again, I always go back to the evidence and the science that supports some of these discussions. Yeah. And what is going on here? What we have here at the bottom of this jar is this white uh, powder that's that's mana. It's it's the traditional mana. You can see it's it's it kind of when it forms it 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 forms as like this conical shape this mound at the bottom of the jar. And this substance, uh, beyond being something that's healing, it, it's also super conductive. So you can imagine, if you consider the, the stories of the ark, the ark was actually created to hold the mana. And then Solomon's temple was created to hold the ark. So th the entire purpose for Solomon's temple was to hold this mana. You know, the, the, the mana went in the ark, the ark went in the temple. And this mana being a superconductive substance, when it was put inside the ark, and the ark was basically like a capacitor. An energy source. An energy source. It just issued a tremendous amount of electricity. And this is the reason why nobody could touch it without dying. And this is a manufacturing process, and this is how this yes, was done. Yes, and this is it, yeah. Okay, so... Again, it's back to the evidence in, into deep history. Yeah. And when we mention uh, the manufacturing of this, uh, of the mana in the jar, there's, uh, there's a cone shape at the bottom. But I think it's represented, uh, Josh, if you could. Yes. Uh, pull up this image here. Is that what we're seeing here, Tim? Yes, that's exactly what you're seeing. So as you see, uh, the figure who represents Osiris is holding this cone-shaped bread and he's handing it to uh, the guy that has the heaven plumes of almond on his head and he's offering it to him and the reason why it's that cone shaped is because that's how it forms when you when you go to make it and there's a lot of excitement in that image uh, to as well <laughs> he's very excited <laughs> what what is what is inside of the ark we 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 are, you mentioned that possibly the mana manufacturing yeah. process is happening there but it's like the biggest mystery in history. What what is inside of the well, ark? Well, traditionally they said that the you know the the tablets the the what we would now know as the tablets of the commandments were put inside the ark as well as a pot of manna is is how it's described. It should be pointed out that Moses had both the Ten Commandments and then he also had these tablets of testimony. And according to alchemical traditions, this tablet of testimony was actually this emerald tablet. Uh, and But these things were put inside. I'm sorry. Did we hear him right? Did he say the emerald tablets? So they do exist. They are real. Remember, they were authored by thought from Atlantis. Side of the ark, um, from a power standpoint, that mana is really a superconductive substance. So when you put a superconductive substance inside a capacitor like the arc, it just causes it to produce an immense amount of electricity that it just broadcasts out. I've got a couple of other images here that mm -hmm. to me represent a vessel. Mm -hmm. I see a vessel here mm -hmm. and we just looked at a mana jar yep. And I see the connection. Is is that what's happening? Yeah. So what we have here. So this is uh, this is at Amiens Cathedral. So one of the things that the Templars did when they came back to Europe is they were responsible for building the first cathedrals of France. 
And inside these cathedrals, they put all kinds of imagery. Most people think of just biblical scenes, but they also depicted alchemical processes uh, for manufacturing this mana. And this is one example of that. You see the figure holding, it's called an Athenor oven. It's an alchemical oven, and they're pulling a salamander out of the bottom of it. And what they're really depicting is in the, the language, the alchemical language, a salamander, they didn't actually believe that lizards lived in ovens, but they knew that like you could break down the word salamander into the word sal and mandra, which meant sal meant salt and mandra meant stable. So what they were saying is you could extract the stable salts out of the oven after you've calcinated down all the other materials. And but so this it, is what they're trying to depict. In this next image, uh, where apparently we're seeing the exact same thing. Yep. And if somebody's walking past this cathedral yeah. and they see this, they would, would they would not make these connections, but they the would. symbolism is right there. Correct, yeah. Yeah, this and this this is another one. This is at, at uh, Amboise, uh, but it's, yeah, they're depicting the exact same thing. And and this these secret salts, these stable salts that they are extracting out is the mana. This is the mana that, that, you know, they have to calcinate down the, the vegetable matter. In fact, for that matter, this is the whole reason why Moses witnessed God as a burning bush, because you have to calcinate down the material uh, and then you can extract the mana out of it. And this is what's being depicted. So if I'm understanding correctly, so let's back up. We have this representation now in Europe Mm -hmm. that was brought to Europe, in the alchemical traditions, yep. from Jerusalem by the Knights Templar. Correct. Who discovered this in Jerusalem, and this is evidence of these uh, alchemical and high-tech traditions that go back to Atlantis. Correct, yeah. And that they were also being preserved in Egypt after the collapse of Atlantis. You know, the, the story is it... Egypt was one of the centers of preservation. Well, okay, so you brought up Edfu. Yeah. So in the Edfu text, mm -hmm. and, and that history certainly points back to the origins coming from Atlantis. Yes. The same catastrophe is yep. represented there in Edfu. Yes. And that is a direct Atlantean connection, which again goes back to Jerusalem, to the Knights Templar, back to Europe, and possibly to the United States. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly how it goes. <laughs> so, is there stuff here in the United States? There is. Uh, there are there are vaults here in the United States that had been brought over as early as the 1200s. Is when um, the Templars they they would leave their port in La Rochelle in France and in Portugal, and they would bring this stuff you know, over here to the new land. They, they had the entire North America mapped by the uh, 1350s, and, uh, but they had been coming over here since the 1200s. And why North America? Uh, to keep things safe, I would think? Yeah, they were trying to create a new Jerusalem. Uh, mm -hmm. They recognized that Europe was completely controlled and dominated by, uh, between the Roman church and the monarchies, uh, they were controlling everything, and people had no freedoms, no freedom of thought, no freedom of religion, no freedom of assembly. Yeah. All the things that we take for granted now as Americans, they didn't have those things. So they came to the New World, they established connections with the natives here, and they uh, brought these artifacts over, and then they set up a new system so that these things could be preserved. Will this eventually be revealed? Yes. And the reason why I ask that is history, the way that it exists today, um, nobody wants to change that. And the reveal of the Knights Templar, understanding, occupying, mapping, and, and spiriting artifacts and important relics into the United States and stashing them yeah. in these vaults, if this is revealed, 
everything has to be rewritten. That's true. Yeah, but it's the it's the history. I mean, uh, you know, there were things, and, and especially I uh, I know you've you've talked with Scott Walter before, you know, but his work with the Kensington Runestone that that runestone was a land claim for North America that was created, and it was placed right in the center of North America because they had already mapped the entire continent. And the connection with the natives that were here, uh, there are still certain tribes that continue to preserve and protect these vaults uh, here in the United States. Now, you're the Grand Master of the yeah. Knights Templar. Yes. Uh, that's a pretty important position, mm -hmm. right? The traditions today inside of the Knights Templar, are they the same traditions uh, from the 1300s? They are. We don't pay any allegiance to the Roman Church anymore. We started out independent of the Roman Church. We had a had a a brief period of time of patronage with the Roman Church, uh, and then the Roman Church, with along with the King of France, suppressed the Templar Order in 1307, uh, and that didn't go too well for for seven years. There was a lot of torture and and burning at the stakes. So Friday. Friday the 13th is when this took place, and it went on for seven years. This is why Friday the 13th is considered unlucky and an omen now. One of the many reasons that they removed it from our calendar, that because they were trying to hide and suppress history, true history, right? Including where the, all of the um, books of the Bible came from. Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, that was the origin of that. At the core of... And again, I want to just remind you that if the Knights Templar are to be connected to anything ugly, nefarious, or sinister, then why is it that the very same Romans and church that wanted to conquer and control the entire world wiped them out best they could to silence them from the knowledge that they had. Why was Jesus silenced? Why do you think we had to all be coming out at the same time, telling you the same truths to help wake you up now? Because they don't want to lose control. They never have. You're like a poor loser, a bad winner and a poor loser. Of, of, of what we are, we've always been dedicated to preserving this tradition. And, uh, you know, we've had to adapt to the, the cultures and the habits of, of the different countries that we've lived and the, and the religious philosophies of the different countries that we uh, have done work in, but ultimately, yeah, it's the same work. And and ultimately, we're also committed to this idea that everybody has a spark of the divine in them. Everybody. And through their own efforts, they can attain a direct knowledge of the divine, and they don't need a priest to do it. These vaults that you referred to earlier, mm -hmm. do you know where they are? Yes. Would you tell me now? I can't tell you right now. <laughs> the importance of that, because when somebody hears that, they go, okay, well, this would change things. Why not Why not speak about this now? And let's let's take a film crew in and, and see what's going on. I think. And again, he's more focused on take the film crew in, let's look at the Ark of the Covenants things. And he totally missed the point that he made right before he, right before Jimmy spoke again, which was that we don't need a middleman to reach the, the divine or divine knowledge. We have that ability and that power within us to connect with the, the divine, to connect with divine knowledge and information, wisdoms. And that includes how to use your psychic gifts, how to Use your energy to heal others and yourself and part storms and all of those wonderful, miraculous things. 
because we have that spark within us. We all have that God-given divinity. I think we're building up to that. We had to make people aware of, of some of the origins of some of this stuff first. And one of the biggest challenges we're going to face once we do reveal it is, you know, you're going to have a number of different countries that are going to try to claim these things for themselves. And we got to get to the point where we're past all that. I mean, these, these relics, these, these treasures are a gift to all humanity. They belong to all of yes. humanity. They don't belong to any one particular power structure. Even though we're protecting them, we didn't even feel like they belong to us. We're just kind of preserving them for the future. So You could tell Josh. He won't tell me. And he, can, <laughs> he can keep the secrets. But here's the thing. Are, are these relics that would not only change history, but change the way that the Bible has been represented to us and 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 jesus and god and mary and joseph is this something that could potentially just tip things over completely yeah i think it'll a lot of things will have to be rewritten or or understood in new light it's not that what the bible says is wrong per se uh, it's just that how it's being interpreted now is different than how it actually is it's going to force people to have to look at these things a little bit differently and and that's a real threat to certain church power structures at the time you so know, currently let, let's back up if we can did the knights templar at that time understand you know in 1300 in jerusalem when you're discovering these things you know possibly that they are important you may not know what they represent certainly when it comes to the alchemical traditions yeah but do you think that they understood enough that it had to be kept secret and that later another generation would understand the importance of this. I think so. Uh, I mean, as evidence of the fact that, uh, you know, when the order was suppressed, it was pretty brutal. And, uh, and they knew the timing of when it would resurface because it's cyclical. It's, there was a reason for that. And it was because the, you know, the church and the monarchy at the time they both had a vested interest in keeping things the way they were. And all of this threatened that. And it still does uh, to a certain degree. I mean, we're talking about technologies, first of all, that are pre-cataclysm technologies that have been preserved. Well, that, that you know, you have to have people accepting that, okay, there may have been a, a previous advanced civilization to begin with. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing you're talking about is personal salvation through your own efforts that has nothing to do with the power structure getting you into heaven. So that's a change. Right. Because it's about looking within to find the answers. And we are who we've been waiting for. We are our saviors. Thoughts for people. You know, another thing, too, that was right along with this is uh, Templars have always sought to preserve the rights of individuals to have the freedom to explore these things. In fact, um, one of the earliest medieval texts was a book called uh, Parsifal by Wolfram von Eschenbach, which is a, the, the, one of the first grail stories, and it was written in the 1200s. In it, it says the Templars are in charge of guarding the grail. And it also says, when the grail appears in the text, it says, if any Templar should become a ruler of a foreign people, let him ensure that they are given their God-given rights. Well, this is the first time in history it's ever suggested that people have God-given rights. And that, uh, you know, because prior to this, people thought your rights came from the church or from the king. And this is saying, no, your church comes from a divinity that transcends all that. And, uh, you know, this is something we still stand for. And, you know, if you're a power structure trying to control people, that's a problem. Can, can Wait, we before, before you move on quickly, I just have to, I need an example of a pre-cataclysmic technology. That was a fascinating line. Yeah, so, well, well these arcs were pre-cataclysmic technologies. I mean, ultimately, I think their purpose is to broadcast electricity, much like the works of... Uh, 
Nikola Tesla when he was when he created his Wardenclyffe Tower, where to 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 broadcast electricity around the planet. This is what these arcs do. They broadcast electromagnetic lines of force around the planet to these sacred areas. And, you know, that's a problem too if you're trying to put a meter on having people pay for electricity. So when we talk about the arc and what may be inside of it, it's the dimensions of the arc too that I'm very curious about. And there, I think there was some pretty successful research into it may fit exactly into the box, some call it a sarcophagus, uh, the box inside of the king's chamber, yes. inside of the Great uh -huh. Pyramid. Coincidence? I think I that think is not. absolutely 100% right on. I mean, the, the, the Great Pyramid itself is, is generates static electricity. If you were to stand on top of the, the Great Pyramid with a bottle, with a, a glass bottle with a wet rag on it and hold it up, sparks would start shooting off of the, the bottle from the, uh, just from the natural, you know, conductivity of how the electricity builds up from the desert. So if you then stuck an arc in the center of it, in that king's chamber, uh, with a superconductive substance in it, it's just gonna broadcast a tremendous amount of electricity within the area. And I think that's exactly what they were doing. With all of this energy, the the depictions of what is created with the Ark of the Covenant, you have to wear body. I'm so stoked right now. The armor to carry it, uh, you can't yeah. look at it directly. Your life is going to change if you do. Uh, with the concentration of this kind of energy inside of the Great Pyramid, uh, it could have done a multitude of things. It's, it wasn't just one specific thing, was it? No, I, I think it was used for a lot of different things, but it was definitely broadcasting electricity out. And I think this electricity was being harnessed at the different temples in the region. In fact, if you look at most of these temples, they have uh, stones with what are known as butterfly clips around the periphery of them. And these butterfly clips, we know that used to have metal in them mm -hmm. and so they were just basically like receivers Antenna. for this electricity so you could just kind of plug your things whatever you had into these things to to run it and i think this is one of the secrets of the ancient world that you know it it, it probably got established originally by the atlanteans that's at least that's what history suggests uh or myth you could say uh and then, you know, as things declined, uh, it just kind of fell apart and then people started stealing the butterfly clips for the metal or whatever. And staying on this, because the the bronze, the copper, whatever metal they were using uh, to uh, bind these stones together certainly suggested a, a large megalithic circuit board, mm -hmm. if you will. But if you have multiple arcs, clearly represented by the Egyptians, yep. uh, were these... And did you know, fun fact about the pyramids, the capstones that are missing on the tops of all of them is said to have either been gold or copper. Huh. These power sources for these different temple complexes and possibly other pyramids throughout Egypt. I think so. And if we also consider that the Great Pyramid itself is in the exact center of the uh, land masses of the world. Right. It was probably broadcasting this energy all around the planet, uh, which is a distinct real possibility. So when these boxes were removed. For all of the ley lines, that's the importance of the ley lines because they help create the grid that goes all the way around the globe. And by the way, I can teach you how to find those ley lines and grids. It's like it shut off the power for the entire planet, which is a real problem, you know? <laughs> if, if you're using that for your, your, your little power base, your control. All of that is great. Have you seen the Ark of the Covenant? Yeah, I've seen one of the arcs. We, we currently, within the Templars, we have six arcs in our possession. Uh, we are aware of potentially four other ones, that's 10 total, uh, but we, we're still trying to get to them at this time.
Can you tell us where you saw that arc? <laughs> yeah, I saw it here in the United States. Really? Yeah. Did you wear body armor? No, because it wasn't activated. Right. Uh, Were you worried about that though? Well, so part of the part of what came with the arc was these rods. It was actually referred to as Aaron's rod in the Bible, but but what these are is grounding rods. You can put you can take the the, the rod, stick it in the ground, and drop it against the arc, and it'll ground all the electricity into the ground, so you can handle it. Ah, huh. doesn't that make much more sense? We we need to circle back though. Yeah. You you mentioned the Holy Grail. Yes. And the the way that Parsifal represented it, I it, I think that it was more of an open book where we can interpret yep. what the Grail actually was. Did the Grail make it to the United States? Did it make it over to the Americas? And what is the Grail? It did. Uh, the Grail has been represented as many things. I mean, it's been. It's been popular in recent years to associate it with uh, some sort of bloodline from Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And, and while that may be true, you know, there were other depictions of the grail as well. I mean, it was described as a stone that can burn the uh, phoenix to ashes after which it comes back renewed. Well, this was, a, this was an alchemical metaphor. That's right. It was also described as an emerald that, that fell out of the crown of Lucifer after this war in heaven, and it was brought to earth by these neutral angels. Well, this emerald was really a, um, it was a metaphor for what was known as the emerald tablet, which is a, a, a tablet of alchemical instruction. And even beyond that, uh, what it really is is it's a it's a substance that looks like an emerald. It's not even really an emerald. It's a it's it's a if you want to get down to it, it's a copper acetate that is crystallized copper that ends up looking like an emerald, and you can extract from this these monoatomic mana atoms that. Uh, that uh, are extracted alchemically. Well, back to uh, uh, Josh's uh, question earlier, where this technology is older than we think, and the alchemical traditions go back, you know, if we go back to the A word, right, Atlantis, yeah. we're pushing this back 10, 20, 30,000 years. Yes, yeah. Let me give you an example of how it has shown up in other ancient civilizations, the same technology. So, so we refer to it as mana. That's the that's what we we encounter in the the Torah or the Old Testament. It's referred to as mana. But we find the same word in the same substance being described in other ancient civilizations. For example, in ancient Sumer, the name of the alchemical science was known as graal, G R A A L, graal, graal, grail. Mm -hmm. So that was literally the name of the alchemical science. And they used it to create something known as shimana. And shimana uh, was, was used to help with the flying craft of the gods, the Anunnaki. We find the same word in the Vedic texts as being called vimana. So we have mana, shimana, vimana, and the, these vimanas were also flying crafts of the gods from pre-cataclysmic times. In the Polynesian cultures, we find it being referred to as mana. Same thing, though. It's this force of nature that they're able to extract. Uh, within the Gnostic traditions, like in um, the Albigensians of southern France, of which the Templars largely came out of, they used to practice a, a ceremony known as the Mani Sola ceremony, and it and it was a it was like a communion rite with this substance that they referred to as Mani. Well, this Mani is the same thing as the Mana, uh, which is the same thing as the Shem. Which is the same thing as you taking the little styrofoam wafer bread thing during communion or Passover or you know whatever depends on what religion you're in you know when what time of year you do that but i mean even christians do that you know southern baptists 
take of the little glass of wine and or the little grape juice. Usually at church, it was grape juice. And the uh, little wafer thing of bread, right? Which is the manna. So the symbolism still lives today. Shemana and the Vimana. And uh, we also find it in, um, you know, a number of other places. So it's it's all these ancient traditions were preserving the same thing, the same science from ancient times. And it it's tied in directly to these arcs. And, uh, and this is one of the things that the Knights Templar got a hold of. It's been right under our noses the whole time and we didn't even know it. How ultimately, Tim, would this change history? And if it did, and it should, for those out there that don't want this history changed, mm -hmm. what kind of fight would, you know, there's gonna be some oppression, uh, you know, from the other side. Um, mm -hmm. How do you move this forward? Uh, again. And I personally don't feel like he answered this question very well. Fundamental to this belief structure is that everybody has this source of the divine within them. So uh, there's no one group that are the only chosen ones at the exclusion of everybody else. We're all in this together. Can, can the world I handle agree. it? I think so. I think we're getting to the point um, with, our, with our modern technologies, you know, with our, our internet and our, and our global community. Uh, we now are associating with each other more recognizing our commonalities. Um, we're, we have to work together now as a world to solve problems and to um, do things that are for the best for the planet and for. And I think really what he's getting to here in his answer is that until enough of us truly awaken to all of these truths, we won't be able to have these type of technologies that they protect for public use and public con consumption, right? Consumerism, if you will, because it's going to take all of us waking up to be able to bypass the 1% that has the control without them just confiscating it and us never seeing it again for ourselves and for the other inhabitants of the planet. And ultimately, I think uh, we have a destiny beyond this planet that we're getting to. And I think all of this ancient technology that we're sitting on and these ancient philosophies are all geared towards helping us go that direction. Does this- Because again, as I said earlier, all along they have known when this would be resurfacing because it is a cyclical event. Conversation today, uh, do I earn a pin? I will definitely give you a pin after we're done. <laughs> Thank you so much. I look forward uh, to everything that is about to be revealed. And, and I do too. And I look forward to the masses waking up to the truths because that is when we truly reclaim our divine rights and our God-given natural law. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already, and let's share these videos far and wide. Because as soon as I get to a thousand subscribers, I'm going to give every one of you a free lesson, crash course, free gift tip. It's going to blow your mind. And it's going to be something that's beneficial that everyone can use. Until then, thanks for visiting. Can you even see that that says Deja Brew? My cute little coffee cup. Wow, there it is. Deja Brew. Waking you up to truth. Peace.